Yeah, I use this little uh, live stream uh, box and it sends it straight to YouTube or Facebook. Gotcha. And Facebook? Well, I can, I have it turned off. Mm -hmm. All right, three, two, one, roll. Hey everyone, my name is Matt Long. I'm in the vapor control group. I'm one of the applications engineers, one of the sales engineers. Uh, and I actually get to design vapor recovery systems and vapor combustion systems. On your schedule, it probably says vapor control. We'll touch a little bit on vapor combustion, but as chemies, you're probably more inclined to know a little bit more about the vapor recovery side. It has a little bit more to do with like mass transfer separation theory. So we'll mostly cover that. Some of the mechanical components, the heart of the system, and a little bit about the process theory. So a little bit of an outline of what we'll go over today. So we'll start off with why we need vapor control. What actually creates the vapors? The different loading methods into the trucks, rail cars, barges, um, tanks. And then go a little bit into the differences between vapor combustion and vapor recovery. Pros, cons between the both of them and then go into what actually makes up a VRU, the mechanical components, process theory. And then go a little bit into designing the loading profiles, what actually we use to make each VRU. So what's on the screen right now, I don't know who all can see it, is just four pictures of what a VRU typically looks like, ranging from incredibly small to a giant refinery type application. And those pictures will come back up later on. So why do we need vapor control? Well, I like to start off first, what differentiates vapor control versus like a flare? So what makes a vapor a vapor? So with a flare, you have a gas mixture coming to you. But that gaseous mixture typically does not have oxygen. It'll be either 100% hydrocarbon or it has some CO2, some nitrogen blanket, something like that. With the vapor, mixture, the presence of oxygen is what changes it from just a straight gas to now being a vapor. So that's where we come into play. People don't like dealing with potentially combustible mixtures, so we get to deal with fun stuff. So air plus some type of volatile liquid, so like a gasoline, a benzene, something like that, when they pass over each other, mix, it creates what's known as an evaporative volatile organic compound, a VOC. Depending on where you're at, that VOC could be anything from methanes all the way up. In the US, you typically see propane all the way up to like your heptane, your hexane. So VOCs as, as themselves are not necessarily bad. You don't want to breathe them or light a fire around them, but they're not going to hurt the environment. You need a combination of the VOC with something else. In this case, in most cases, it's a combination of UV, which comes from sun, the sun rays, and products of combustion. So your NOx, which is comprised of NO2, NO3, N2O4. The combination of all of that creates ozone, which is the primary constituent of smog. NOx also creates another thing that you may have heard of, acid rain. It can also create that, as well as if you have some type of hydrogen sulfide compound. So, the typical applications that we see this type of technology creating vapors, you don't see it so much on like the end of a process, so end of a separator or something like that. It's usually some type of loading application. So the four main cases that we see, there's a couple of outliers there, but we see it in some type of storage tank. If you go down to the Holly refinery, you'll see all of their storage tanks. Anytime they load one of those, they have to have some type of vapor control, whether it's a VRU, a VCU, or a floating roof tank. Uh, truck loading, which is similar to like a giant quick trip truck being loaded with gasoline or unloading the gasoline. Rail car and ship loading. The three pictures here, we don't have rail car loading pictured here. It's not as interesting to look at, um, but it looks pretty similar to like a truck. So back in the 70s is when vapor control kind of started to create a foothold. Before that, they didn't really care too much. Uh, you could load your trucks, your cars, they didn't really care. But in the 70s, they realized that these VOCs that were coming off of these products weren't good for the environment. So they said, okay, let's just reduce 90%. That should be good enough for the environment. Keep on your merry way. So we said, okay, we can do that. After some testing, they realized we could get a lot lower than that. So they said, okay, 
what, what can we do to get it down lower? How far can we go? So they brought it down to roughly a 92, 93% removal. And they said, all right, that's as good as you can get. Well, six years later, they said, ah, we're, we can do a lot better than that. Technology is so much better. Controls are so much better. It doesn't have to be as manual now. So let's make it, let's make it better. So that's where the 35 milligrams per liter came in. That's where Canada, Mexico are essentially staying at right now. They say, you're doing well enough for the environment. You're good where you're at. But in the States, they decided, we want to go even lower than that. What can we get down to so we're not affecting the environment in a negative way? That's where the 10 milligrams per liter came in. This rule, which is what most facilities in the US are subject to, is called the MAC rule, the Maximum Achievable Control Technology Rule. Um, and then 14 years later, you notice it goes back up, but that encapsulates everything, not just your VOCs. It's anything that can be burned. And that's facility-wide, not just that specific component. So while it looks like it goes back up, it's still roughly around the same amount for VOCs, at least. So that's what's used to date in the US. But in your European markets, your Asia markets, you typically see it a little bit more strict. Uh, specifically in the European market, Germany kind of sets the standard for air emission qualities. Um, they have what's called TA Luft. Um, you'll notice on the last slides, it was grams per milliliter or grams per liter. In Europe, you'll see more on a grams per normal meter cubed. The N there does not stand for nano. It's normal. So it's similar to like standard conditions, STP, but instead of needing to meet 1 ATM and 0 degrees C, it changes depending on where you're at. Normal conditions can be anywhere from 1 ATM to 25 degrees C to 20 degrees C to 30 degrees C. It's a little weird, so there's not really a good go-by for that. You have to just reach out to that specific country or state and try to figure out what they deem as normal conditions, which makes it a little bit of a pain in the butt. Um, but in Germany, it gets to be a little bit more strict. So in the US, it's usually your propanes up that we monitor and have to control. In Germany, it started off with ethane and up, and now it ends with, OK, you have to control everything. We don't care what you're emitting. If it can cause any damage to the environment, we're counting it. So that's where that stands. And then benzene and marine have started to get a little bit more strict as well. Sorry, it's not moving. Eventually it'll move. There we go. So that's a little bit about vapor control, why we need it, how the vapors are actually generated. But how are these vapor how are the vapors actually generating within the loading product itself? So there's three types of loading methods which you've probably seen at one point or another. There's splash loading, submerged pipe loading, and uh, uh, loading from bottom loading. So splash loading would generate the highest concentration of vapors. So the reason of that is as your liquid is going in, it's turbulent, it's hitting the walls, it's hitting other liquids, it's going to generate a lot of vapors. So there's a certain saturation factor that goes with that. Usually it's like Point, it's 90% of whatever your liquid composition is will probably be vapor. So that's how loading started off in the US. Then they moved to submerged fill pipe loading, which is exactly like it sounds. Open a hatch, put a pipe down, start loading. It's not as turbulent. It still creates more vapors than the best case, which is the next slide. Usually that's about 80, 85% of your concentration of your liquid will also be in vapor form. And the best case, bottom loading, which is how most, uh, most places do it in the States. They're actually required to do it now. So in this case, you actually connect, like it says, through the bottom of whatever vessel you're using, in this case a truck. And it generates less vapors. Usually it's about 70% of whatever the liquid is, is what you pull off as a vapor. So with that being said, there's really two ways you can generate some type of vapor. There's called vapor control stage one and stage two. These happen at your quick trips, your Phillips, your shelves, whenever the big trucks are actually putting the liquids back into their underground tanks. So this is called vapor balancing. Whenever you actually send your vapors 
back into the truck. So as the liquids leave, the vapors go back in. Those trucks will eventually have to discharge that vapor somewhere. That's where a vapor combustor or vapor recovery unit comes in. Now, vapor control stage two is not as prevalent. This is something you see a lot in New Jersey and some places in California. Uh, anyone that's been there, you might notice that their nozzles for their gas fill-up stations are a lot bigger than we have here in Tulsa. What it has is it has the normal nozzle that goes into your car, but it has a secondary nozzle that goes around your nozzle to actually capture any vapors coming off of it. And they'll actually recover that back into their tank, which will eventually go back into the truck, which will eventually have to make its way back to the main loading station where some type of vapor control technology whether it's VCU or VRU, actually will take care of whatever vapor it is. If there are any questions that I'm going on, feel free to stop me. So what you'll see worldwide when you get into industry for this type of application, there are two technologies, vapor recovery unit, a VRU, and a vapor combustion unit, a VCU. The VRU, as you can see, is a lot more complicated. There's a lot more vessels, a lot more rotating equipment. A VCU is pretty straightforward. You have a, you have a stack that burns stuff. Pretty simple. Um, but there's some pretty significant pros and cons between the two of them. With the VRU, one of the biggest driving factors for why companies like VRUs is that you can get a return on your investment. Since you're actually recovering your product, if the product is theirs, they can actually sell that back to the grid, sell that back as propane, liquid propane, liquid butane, actually make some money back. And it's usually a pretty quick return on their investment. Usually it's like a four or five year investment and then after that it's just money. Something they get to keep, keep getting profit. From an environmental standpoint, it's nice because unlike combustion, now all you're having to deal with is dealing with the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. You don't generate any NOx, you don't generate any CO, you don't generate any CO2. Since there isn't a flame, one of the best factors is you can put this really anywhere because it can be installed in a class one div one, class one div two type area, depending on how they classify it. Um, you just have to deal a little bit more with the electrical components, whether you have seals, conduits, something like that. And then there's no fuel gas. Unlike a combustor where you have to have pilot gas, cis gas to keep it hot, you don't have anything here, all you need is electricity. So sometimes they, this is their only option because they only have electricity at site. But the disadvantage is it's a lot more expensive than a vapor combustor is and it has a much higher operating cost because now since you're running only on electricity, you have to power pumps, you have to power uh, vacuum pumps. It, is, it gets pretty expensive, but again, you do make a return on your investment, so usually it uh, takes away that factor. And then one of the biggest disadvantages there's limited applications for it. Because of the way the VRU is designed, it recovers using a activated carbon species, which has an affinity towards only a certain type of compound. So depending on the application, it may not work and you are stuck with a VCU. So on the flip side of that, a VCU is incredibly low capital cost. It's similar to a flare. So there's not really any, ro the only two rotating equipments are a valve and a blower. So it's super easy to maintain. It's just a fairly passive device, unlike a VRU, which has a lot of moving parts. Uh, because all you're doing is burning, you don't really have to worry about chemicals mixing too much. Of course, you don't want to have anything that'll auto-ignite within the pipe, but in terms of sending a bunch of random chemicals to it, as long as it's burnable, it's going to go through the stack and not, you don't have to worry about it. So that's one of the things that a lot of companies will like, because now they don't have to worry about recovering it. It just goes out the top of the stack, meets their emissions, they can keep going on their merry way. Um, unfortunately, you do create pollutants that are not seen on the VRU, the NOx, CO, CO2, which can get pretty stringent depending on where you're at. California and Texas are pretty strict. Same with New Jersey. Everywhere else in the States is usually pretty easy to get with for a VCU, but eventually they'll probably move towards being strict like New Jersey, California, and Texas. So that's kind of a brief comparison between the two. There's a little bit more that goes into it. VRU takes up a lot more space than a VCU is, so sometimes that's the determining factor. So for a VRU and a VCU, they come in all shapes and sizes. It's a very customizable piece of equipment. 
So if you don't have the space, usually you can make some weird bends in the pipe or stack stuff on top of each other and you can get, a, you can get around space limitations. But one thing you'll notice for all of these slides, you'll see 6,000 probably barrels per hour or some type of barrels per hour unit. If you work in industry here in the States, that's something you'll probably have to get used to seeing. A lot of barrels per hour, a lot of standard cubic feet per minute or per hour, SCFM or SCFH, a lot of gallons per minute. You won't see as much SI units unless you start working with international customers. So get used to it. It's coming. Um, you can also put systems in series. They're all, there's going to be a little bit of some problems with putting it in series because now you have to deal with hydraulic, question, hydraulic problems. Easy to deal with. It's just something to keep in mind. That's where we come in handy, actually going through and doing the actual design of all the pressure drops that can happen across the system. And then these next couple of slides are just different pictures of what a VRU can look like. So we'll touch this a little bit more in a second, but with a VRU, the major components are carbon beds, an absorber tower, and your vacuum pumps. Those are your three big components that you have within a VRU itself. And each one has their own design restrictions. So we'll go ahead and just kind of skim through this bit here and actually get into the fun part, which is the process theory. So we'll go a little bit into what activated carbon is, why it works, as well as it works. Go a little bit into separation theory. So we there the original vapor recovery unit was a liquid vacuum pump type technology which has a seal fluid. You don't want to recover that seal into your product tanks, so you have to have what's called a three-phase separator to actually remove the liquid out of that and recover only the vapor portion. And then we'll touch a little bit into difference between negative pressure or vacuum and positive pressure. There's a table that shows kind of a good correlation between how to calculate the difference between the two and then a little bit into the loading profile. So there's a lot of terms here. We'll go into each one individually. So I won't really stay too long on that slide. So the first one, which is by far the most important part of VRU, is activated carbon. This is the heart of our system. It's what makes us be able to regenerate and capture our hydrocarbons and not just let it vent out the top. This material is extremely porous. If you grab a handful of it, the amount of activated carbon you have in your hand is equivalent to the surface area of a football field in just that amount. So that's why it works so well for this type of application is it doesn't have to take up that much space. I mean, you saw the carbon beds, they, they're big, but in the grand scheme, the amount that's in there is 100 times bigger than a football field without taking up the same amount of space. So adsorption, AD, and absorption, AB, is two, are two of the terms that are usually easily confused because they're essentially the same thing with the change of one letter in each one, a D versus a B. So there's a pictogram on the next slide that shows a pretty good way of differentiating the two. But technically, the adsorption is adhering of some type of molecule to the surface of some type of solid. These interactions are held together by van der Waal forces. So if you go all the way back to Gen Chem 1, then you remember van der Waal forces are the weakest of all, the, uh, all of the forces. But it's still strong enough to actually grab these molecules and hold them. But that means you have to break that bond somehow. Absorption is where we actually recover the product. So it's the way of making sure that you're not just going to be over your mission limit all the time. And that's to take it in, to make it part of you, to make it whole or soak it up. So that pictogram I was talking about, this is probably my favorite picture in this whole uh, presentation because I love pie. So if you think of it, adsorption is like getting a pie to your face. It's all over you, but it's not inside of you unless you had your mouth open. Then that doesn't count but it's all over you. Absorption, on the other hand, is actually being able to eat the pie. And as you can see, get a little bit of a belly going there. So that's two of the best ways of 
looking at adsorption versus absorption. Both incredibly, incredibly important for VRU technology. So bleed through versus breakthrough. These are two terms that kind of go together. Bleed through is where we typically want to operate. That means your activated carbon is doing its job. You're flowing vapors through it. It's capturing all those vapors. And then the residual amount, a very small portion, is going out through the vent, usually so small that it doesn't really matter. It's part of your uh, permit. It's OK. But after a certain amount of time, these hydrocarbon vapors are going to keep going up through. And eventually, it's going to reach the top of your carbon bed. Now, it's not going to take any more hydrocarbon in. If it keeps operating at that state, all of that's just going to go out the top of the stack, and now you're out of your permit, and people aren't going to be happy with you. That's the breakthrough. And there are ways of getting around that, ways of increasing the efficiency of your carbon bed, which we'll touch a little bit later. So emission limits, we kind of already touched on this, so I won't spend too much time on it. But again, I just wanted to point out, so North America is usually a milligram per liter loaded. In really anywhere else in the world, it's not going to be the amount loaded. It's going to be the amount vented, which is a lot more difficult to calculate and predict coming out. It's possible, but it takes a lot of research, a lot of background information that you have to acquire over years and years of experience. So VOC, like I said, it's a reactive organic compound that reacts with different chemicals in the air. It makes ozone, makes smog. Um, in the rest of the world, they don't look at VOCs the same way. They just assume everything coming off is going to be some type of problem, problematic compound, so deal with it. Um, regeneration is another term. So within regeneration, there's two subterms that are important to know. So first off, regeneration, like it sounds, is unlike growing back an arm or growing back a tail for a lizard, what you're doing is actually taking your hydrocarbons off of your activated carbon and recovering that with some type of liquid or condensing type application. To achieve that, there's two ways that most companies will do it, most VRU technology manufacturers. The first part is a vacuum strip. This is where you actually start pulling a negative pressure down on the carbon beds, and you start trying to pull off some of the hydrocarbons. So it isn't strong, it doesn't have enough there to break all the van der Waal forces, but it can take some of it off usually the really, really high level stuff. The more important part, after you reach a certain vacuum, now you can introduce air into the system. The air will actually have a higher affinity for the hydrocarbon than the hydrocarbon does to, that was weird, than the hydrocarbon does to the activated carbon. So it can break those forces that are used to keep these vapors, or what were vapors, on the activated carbon. So the next is the vacuum pump capacity. Okay, that's all nice and dandy, but how do you actually get this vacuum you need to actually pull these things back off to regenerate them? Well, there's two technologies that most people use, a dry vacuum pump technology and a liquid ring vacuum pump technology, which I'll go into the difference in the next slide or two. But this vacuum pump tech capacity is determined by looking at the air and vapor mix coming off at a specific vacuum level. Now this is going to change as you get higher and higher in your vacuum level. So what you'll see a lot of people doing to determine what the actual capacity of the vacuum is, they do it over an average range of time in an average range of vacuum pressures. So vacuum itself, like I said, is used to denote pressure that's below atmospheric, some type of negative pressure. Um, you'll see most things on these slides won't show it as negative pressure. It'll just be some type of pressure absolute is how we typically deem it. But a high vacuum is the same thing as a low pressure. So if you get a high or really deep vacuum, that means you're moving farther and farther away from atmospheric pressure. So farther and farther away from 14.7 PSIA or zero gauge. So an absolute vacuum, which thankfully we don't have to reach, is 
pretty close to 30 inches absolute, 29.92 inches of mercury absolute. Our systems, we typically operate somewhere around the three inches of mercury absolute. And then if you, you have a high efficiency system, you operate at one inch mercury absolute. So that's the three inches is like 90% of an absolute vacuum. We recently heard the term from a lot of our vacuum pump suppliers that calls the vacuum pressure we need to maintain a gross vacuum because it's so easy to get to. So this is that table I was talking about that shows the difference between the vacuum pressure versus an absolute pressure versus atmospheric pressure. Good way of knowing. So depending on the perspective you look at it, if you want to look at it from a vacuum side, it's 0 to 30. If you look at it from an uh, absolute side, it's 30 to 0, depending on which way you want to swing. So we operate typically somewhere around the 3 inches of absolute, or 27 inches of vacuum. So we're close, but not really that close to a perfect vacuum. All right, so the fun stuff. So this is a PFD of what a dry vacuum pump system would typically look like. So we'll kind of go through it real quick. So you'll load some type of product here, and that's going to generate your vapors, your air. The hydrocarbons are shown as orange, and the blue is your air. So any type, time you have air, you're going to have some type of water, just from the humidity in the air. So one thing that is always required on any type of system that has some type of air inside of it is some type of condensate collection device, whether that's a knockout tank, a drip leg, some type of just a slope with a valve to drain, something just something to capture what's there because when you have any type of rotating equipment, you don't want liquid going through if you can help it. So after it reaches that, you'll notice that these are mirror images of each other. So the way that we've designed it is to allow for continuous operation. You have one side in adsorption mode, AD, and you have one carbon bed, that one on the right or left from your perspective, as a regeneration mode. So after a certain amount of time, it'll swap. But you'll notice that the green valves are the valves on. <clears throat> so you'll pass your vapors through your bed. And after it reaches a certain point, it won't be able to take any more. It's essentially air. One thing you'll see is with the isotherms, the more concentrated the vapor is, the more likely it's going to take it in. So once you get super lean, it just passes by. It doesn't care anymore. So once it's purified it, so to speak, it vents the rest of its atmosphere. So that's the first half of the process. The second half is the regeneration mode, the mode that's the most important. Without that, it's a one-time use carbon bed, and that's a really expensive thing to have a one-time use for. So this is, you'll start pulling your vacuum with your vacuum pump. In this case, it's a dry vacuum pump. You'll pull a vacuum down. For this case, we'll just say three inches. Once you get to that vacuum level, this valve, this purge air valve, will open. So you've done your vacuum strip. So now you introduce the air for your purge air strip. So you'll start purging and start pulling more of your hydrocarbons off. Now, when on the discharge side of the vacuum pump, we have an absorber vessel. That's where your regeneration actually happens. So that's where the mass transfer happens. You have a liquid that's very lean ready to take in a rich vapor that sprays down on top. It goes through some random packing and your vapors will go up through the vapors and you'll recover most of your vapors in that liquid. Now, it's not gonna be perfect. You can't get everything in the liquid. So some of that vapor is gonna have to come off the top and go back in to your vapor header to go back through the adsorption process again. After it passes through the now rich absorbent, rich liquid, just goes back into the tank, repeats the cycle again. So the first vapor recovery unit made used a liquid ring type technology. This technology is still used in Asia, still used in Europe. They don't like the dry vacuum pump technology. 
This is a more robust type technology, but it has a lot more bells and whistles and a lot more maintenance requirements. So that's why we've switched from it here in the US. But for the first, most part, it's the same. You're loading, you go into some type of condensate collection device, you go in and you pass through to your adsorption. The change happens with the second part. There's a lot more bells and whistles here. So you have four new pieces of equipment that get added in. So you have now a liquid ring vacuum pump, which the difference between the two, for a dry vacuum pump, the ones that we use is called a dry, a twin screw rotary. So it has very tight tolerances to the housing, and as it rotates against each other, it creates that vacuum. With a liquid ring type technology, thought I was charging, oh, it's off. That's probably why I did it. Um, with a liquid ring type technology, you don't have that tight tolerance. This is a more robust type of vacuum pump. But what you need to create that vacuum now is called a seal fluid. This seal fluid actually will encapsulate the entire interior of the vacuum pump to create that vacuum. But now you're introducing a liquid into your vapor, which you don't want to recover into your product tank. So that's where the separator comes in. With the separator, now we are able to drop out the liquid and pull the vapor out of the top. There's some sizing criterion that we'll go in, into a little bit later in the presentation. But another problem with that is, okay, so now the discharge, anytime you have a discharge of some type of ro rotating equipment, the temperature is going to increase. If we keep using the same seal fluid without cooling it down, eventually it's going to get so hot that it could damage the equipment or ignite the vapors, whatever it might be. So we introduce a heat exchanger to the equation. But instead of needing some type of cold water or something like that to cool it down, we actually use the same absorbent, because it's in a giant tank that's near ambient temperature, to help cool that down, because all we really care about is keeping it below like 120 degrees, roughly. And then after that, it's, it's all the same. So this is, if it pops up, maybe, yeah, a little bit, a little am, animation of how a VRU works. Kind of goes into the exact same thing I did, but it just animates it. Makes it a little bit more interactive. So what's shown here is a liquid ring vacuum pump to show a little bit more of the complexity that goes into it. So you're looking at the absorber, the two carbon vessels, and then the separator, the bottom there. So it starts off, you go into the vapor inlet, it tees off and goes to the bed that's, the carbon bed that's online in an adsorption. So it'll go through the bottom of the bed, it's a upflow type vessel, rather than a downflow vessel. So you'll see the rich vapors start to go through the carbon and it starts off orange or red and slowly gets to blue, which is symbolic of the air inside of it. So after that, it goes down, goes through sometimes an arrestor of some sort in case lightning hits. And now you have air. On the other half, you go through your regeneration process. It's pulled a vacuum. You're doing some of your vacuum strip right now and it goes into the liquid ring pump. So that seal fluid that I was talking about is that blue, and the yellow is your rich hydrocarbon vapor. So you have that seal fluid on the inside. But now you're mixing the two. So in the separator, you have your liquid come down, your seal fluid. And then you have, of course, some of your hydrocarbons will get into the seal fluid. Now your seal fluid goes through that heat exchanger, it's just a plate heat exchanger, so it doesn't take up much space and it gets the job done. And then that goes back into the vacuum pump. Now the vapor from the discharge of the pump will go up through the absorber. So you see it start coming up through there. And you spray your lean absorbent down to capture that hydrocarbon vapor, most of it. 
and the angle of that spray actually will change how efficient your absorber vessel will be. And then that residual waste vapor that can't get absorbed into the liquid goes back into your waste header, your vapor header. And then it shows the purge valve because we haven't gone through that yet. So then your purger valve opens up, just a solenoid valve, three quarter inch or inch line. And that air goes through and does the purge air stripping portion of it. And then after set time, it swaps. So <clears throat> that's kind of the process theory behind how it works, uh, how a VRU works. Does anyone have any questions so far? All right, we'll keep on going. So like I said, activated carbon is the heart of a VRU system. Without that, it doesn't really work. It's just a vessel that something passes through and goes right off the top. Activated carbon can be made with really anything. We've used wood before. We've used coconuts, peach pits, coal. The most prominent you'll see in industry is typically the coal, just because there's more of it. To mass produce coconuts, a coconut type activated carbon, you would need a lot of coconuts, and there's not enough in the world, at least if you want to keep eating them. Um, so what they do is they actually will devolatize it. They will heat it up to about 1,000 degrees, depending on the material, and remove anything that might react negatively from it. So remove any oxygen to make sure there's no fires as well. But they'll heat it up, remove anything on it, and now it's activated. It can be used in any type of service, whether that's using it for your gas mask filters, whether that's using it for your air filters, um, whether that's for this type of technology. So activated carbon is an amorphous structure. It's, it looks regular here, because these are the pellet versions. They look the same, but when you look at the internals of the activated carbon, which you can with like some type of scanning technology, they are completely different. They're similar to like a snowflake, where you catch one snowflake and you examine it, you catch another one, they look completely different. They look the same from the top eye view, but after that, that that's the extent of it. It's about 80% carbon by weight, and the activated carbon we use is microporous. So there's microporous, mesoporous, and macroporous. To actually be able to take off what we want, you want it to be a micropore type technology. And this just kind of shows the difference in the diameters to be considered micropore or mesopore. So the 20 angstroms is incredibly, incredibly small. I can't even make it with my hand. So to give you an idea, an angstrom is 3.97 times 10 to the negative 9th inch. So one of my hairs, or anyone's hairs, is about 500,000 angstroms in diameter. So that's how small these pores are. And there's billions of them in one single pellet. So like I was saying before, if you have a handful of activated carbon, you have the surface area of a football field in your hand which is incredible to think about. There's actually PhD programs out there specifically looking at how can we use this activated carbon in other facets, whether that's using it for some type of battery technology or something like that. So these are kind of what is used or what size pores we would need for this type of technology. So gas masks are super microporous. Um, this is kind of where we're at right now. So we're somewhere in between the micropore and mesopore typically. Uh, we want to make sure we can take some of it off, so a lot of research has, have, it has been done to actually figure out what size pore we need to actually recover off these hydrocarbons. <laughs> Don't know what he's talking about. So some major factors to control the adsorption kinetics, so the ability for the activated carbon to actually take the hydrocarbons out of that vapor and put them onto their pores. There are four of them that are the major factors. 
the type of adsorbent, so whatever activated carbon you're using, each one has a different isotherm, a different way of, or different uh, capacity that it can have. The particle size, the pore size, the gas velocity is incredibly important. If you don't have enough retention time, all it does is pass right on through. And then the bed depth, which is just allows to help reduce that velocity down, as well as increase the retentivity of it. So another thing, the temperature of the inlet stream, if it's too hot, it's not going to adsorb. It's going to just keep on going through. Heat's one of the ways to help break those van der Waal forces. So you want to make sure it comes in near, near ambient, somewhere between 60, 100 degrees, roughly, is where you want to have it. Anything higher, it'll start going on through. Um, the adsorption process is actually an exothermic reaction. So as you keep putting more and more on it, it actually will get hot. Um, we actually go through a process when you first start up these systems. If you don't go through what we call a saturation process, you will actually potentially create a fire in the bed. So activated carbon, if you think about it, it's like a golf ball in the sense that golf ball has a bunch of pores on the outside. If you put dirt on it and then just try to wipe it, some of the dirt stays on the golf ball in those crevices. Carbon's the same way. It's called the heel of the carbon. Whatever gets stuck in there does not come off without some type of external help. Usually that's heating it up. So we want to make sure we keep that stream pretty cool. And then, of course, the concentration of the hydrocarbon. The richer the concentration, the more likely it's going to be to take on these uh, hydrocarbons onto the activated carbon. And you'll see the isotherm in a couple slides that shows that. Um, heat of absorption and other contaminants also do it. The main ones that affect, that we usually care about, are these first six. So, we'll let this go all the way through. So other properties of activated carbon, or at least the key properties that we care about, is that it has a very high adsorption capacity. So in relation to how much it has, it has a very high what we call butane working capacity. Um, we want to make sure that it has fairly uniform particle size. So we use a lot of pellets. So we want to keep the same 3 millimeter pellet or 2 millimeter pellet, um, while the actual pores will change between them. We want to make sure those are the same. That way, when you pack it into the bed, it's not just all going to float to one side or another. We want to make sure we take up as much space as possible to remove any void space inside of those, the carbon beds. Um, and it has a very long service life. So you may hear some people that have like some type of catalyst that they have to change out the catalyst every year. Because of the process of taking the hydrocarbons off of the carbon and then loading it back up again, you can use the same carbon beds for 5, 10, 15 years and never have to replace them. And then replace them later and deal with it then. So that's one of the key factors to why activated carbon works so well. Otherwise, your return on your investment would take years and years and years if you had to keep changing it out. So with the adsorption process, if you increase the pressure within the vessel, you can increase the adsorption capacity. But the problem with that is once you start dealing with really high pressures, you have other problems that can happen. Now you have to have flanges rated differently. You have to take care of the pipe in a different fashion. So the easier, easier way is lowering your temperature and increasing the hydrocarbon concentration. So with your diesels, you're not going to create any type of vapor really. So if you want to try to recover anything off of the diesel, you'll put it into a tank and let it increase in concentration before you actually send that to the VRU. So this is the isotherm graph that I was telling you about. So you can see it has kind of two different things. It has your temperature difference, so 70 down to 212. But it also shows the uh, concentration in parts per million and how likely it is to increase the capacity of the carbon. So you can see low temperature, high concentration, you get the highest recovery percentage. So you get about, for every five 
for every five grams or 0.5 grams that you recover, you would need 0.5 grams of carbon. And then it changes as you keep going down farther, or 100 grams of carbon. It keeps going farther and farther and farther down as you keep going. So that's why once it gets to the top of the bed, you're not really recovering much because your concentration is near zero. Your carbon's not going to want to take anything else in at that point. So gasoline in and of itself has a bunch of different characteristics. It changes concentration all the time, depending on where you're at, what type of, or who actually refined the gasoline. But this is a pretty typical composition of gasoline vapors. It's mostly air, but it does have your C3s through C4s, your propanes through your butanes. Diesel is like 98, 97% air, and then very small amounts of hydrocarbon. So while carbon has an affinity, it changes with each type of waste gas that you send to it. So this is showing the difference between butane and ethanol. So it has a higher affinity towards the ethanol than it does to the, towards the butane, even as you keep going farther and farther down with the concentrations. So one way, or three ways to help the regeneration process, so taking it off of your activated carbon, is lowering your pressure inside your vessel, so bringing your vacuum higher and higher and higher, or lowering your hydrocarbon concentration. So that's where the, that purge air strip comes into play. Since you're lowering your hydrocarbon concentration inside the vessel, it's more likely to come off now. It doesn't want to stay on the activated carbon. And then one way that isn't really used as much anymore, um, it was used a lot back in the 80s and 90s, but they had some problems with it, um, is using a high temperature, so passing steam or something through it. That can create some problems. If it gets too hot, you might mess with the pore size of the activated carbon. You could melt the activated carbon, which you don't really want to do, because then you just have tar inside your beds, which is pretty hard to remove. Um, so the first two are really what we use in the vacuum strip and the purge air strip. So there's three real main principles that we use in our separation. So in the separator to remove the seal fluid from the vapors, from the liquid ring type application. Momentum, so how fast the particle is going to be going through. Gravity settling, so that's a factor of retention time. And then coalescing. We use mostly the first two whenever we're designing these type of separators. So the rest, you can see here, the liquid and vapors would come on through this left side and make its way over before leaving out through the top. The retention time, if you, whenever we decide, design the diameter of these separators, it lowers the overall velocity. So as you lower the velocity, the liquid's more likely to fall out of that mix, where the vapor is going to just keep going on its way. It's going to be lighter than air. It's going to keep on going. For absorption theory, <clears throat> there are four main factors to take into consideration. There's a vapor flow, so we want to make sure that whatever their max flow rate is, we design the beds to withstand the velocity, uh, withstand, have enough residence time to go through it, retention time, and make sure you're not just going to fluidize your bed. If you flow too much through it, you'll actually change your carbon to ash. Um, the vapor pressure of the absorbent is also key. So if you have too high of a vapor pressure, so there's, it's too rich already, it's not going to want to take anything in. So you'll hear a reed vapor pressure or a true vapor pressure. The true vapor pressure, once you get above 11 PSIA, it's worthless in terms of uh, absorption. It's just gonna, it's too rich by that point. You may take some in, but you won't take very much. You wanna usually be somewhere around the six to eight true vapor pressure, um, PSIA, to be a true lean absorbent. And then 
from mass transfer, you probably know a little bit about the, the theoretical trays and the liquid to vapor ratio. Those two are key to make sure that your absorber is designed appropriately to make sure the mass transfer actually happens. So kind of already went over this a little bit, but you want to make sure while we have random packing inside, you want it to be fairly uniform so that you don't just have a bunch of packing on the right side and the left side's open. You want to make sure it has enough time to interact with the packing, the liquid, the vapor, to actually have that mass transfer to occur. Um, one way of increasing the efficiency is creating a higher pressure. Um, you can do that with just having a higher back pressure on the vapor valve here so that not as much of it can leave. That can be one way to increase the pressure. Um, there's some problems with that. You want to make sure you actually still can have vapors go through. So there's a certain point where you can't go really any higher on the pressure side. Um, and like I said before, so your spray nozzle is about right here. If you change your angle, so anywhere between a 40 degree and a 70 degree angle, you can change how efficiently you will actually recover your vapors into your liquid. So depending on the size of the absorber, you may need to change the angle of your spray nozzle. As you get bigger, you're going to have less of an angle. So the last section is how to actually size a VRU. What do we use to, to size these VRUs from a loading uh, capacity? So the three factors, since activated carbon is the heart of the system, we want to make sure we have enough activated carbon within it to have the retention time we need to make sure the isotherm from the isotherm will actually recover as much as we think we're going to recover and not just blow through it. The geometry of the carbon bed is key, <coughs> so if we had squares, a square bed, you would miss your corners. With a cylindrical bed, now it's not going to get stuck. There's not going to be a void space there where nothing happens. And then the vacuum pump capacity is the other thing. We want to make sure we actually pull enough, fast enough, off the carbon beds. Otherwise, whenever you switch, you may not have finished cleaning off or polishing your bed. So this is what we typically would send to like a customer. So with a VRU, there's five things you need to know. You need to know what's the maximum rate they can load. And then after that, you need to know a 15 minute load, one hour load, four hour load, and then 24 hour or what we call a daily load. So the instantaneous helps to design the carbon bed itself. The 15 minute helps to design kind of the purge. How long will you need to adsorb and then how much purge will you need to pull it off? The one hour and four hour help to, des to design the vacuum pump capacity and also the adsorber capacity. And the daily is just to make sure that over that certain period of time, you're not going to exceed your emission limits. So to get your instantaneous rate, that's usually pretty straightforward. Whatever their liquid loading arm rate is, is the vapor loading arm, just mass transfer. Whatever comes in has to come out. So if they say, this is for a truck rack, if they say that they have six lanes and three arms at 600 gallons per minute per arm, okay, your instantaneous is 10,800 gallons per minute. Super easy to do, um, but that would be, uh, that changes depending on how long will it take to fill up a truck? So a trucks typically can get filled up in about eight to 10 minutes. So your instantaneous may be that high, but when you get to your 15 minute, it's not an exact multiplier of the arms lanes times time. There's that factor taken into account. How long will it take to fill up a truck? One thing that happens when you fill up a truck, now they have to take apart all the hoses, drive forward before the next truck can hook up. So that's why you don't really have a true full flow times 15 minutes or times 12 minutes. It's going to be a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of an average there. Like I said, this helps to determine how much carbon is going to be re required to make sure that we can adsorb the full truck capacity. So for the one hour, four hour, and daily throughput, again, this is, you're not going to be loading 
every single minute of every single day. So it's not as simple as taking your arms, your trucks, times your lanes, and multiplying out by six, 60 by four hours by 24 hours. There's gonna be some dead times. So you may only load half the amount of time over an hour or over a four hour period. So that's where kind of using your best engineering judgment will come into play. Knowing, okay, what have we seen historically? What do we need to do to make sure that whatever they design, whatever we design will meet whatever they need, including future expansions? So you'll, you'll hear that a lot once you get into industry, that it's going to be your best engineering judgment. There's not always going to be a black and white answer for what you need to do. Um, so that's where leaning on people that have more experience than you comes in handy. Um, with the one hour and four hour, it also helps to design a vacuum pump size, like I said. So, that's it for my presentation. I was trying to hit an hour. I think I did pretty well to that. Any questions about VRU or VCUs? I prefer VCUs, personally. That's what I love selling and designing, but from a chemical engineering side, VRU is more interesting. Yeah? Um, what do you guys use as the absorber? Repeat the question. So, <laughs> he asked, what do we use for our absorber? Are you talking about how we actually design it, or? Oh, I mean, uh, because at the last part of the process, you said uh, mm -hmm. when it goes through, I guess, that pack bed, not mm -hmm. the carbon. Yep. Uh, and then at the top, you know, there's that nozzle, and then there's the, the liquid, I guess, that comes mm -hmm. down through there that, that the gas gets absorbed into. So what do we use for the absorbent? Yeah, that liquid. So the absorbent usually is a lot. So VRUs are used a lot in gasoline terminal type applications. So you're, you're normal diesel, your regular, or sorry, your regular gasoline, your premium gasoline, and your plus grade gasoline. So what we typically see is in this application, we'll use like your regular gasoline to recover everything. Um, so we'll pack from these giant tanks that are hundreds of like 100 to 300,000 gallons uh, of volume. We'll take a small portion of that, usually like 100 gallons per minute, and spray it through the top of that. Um, and it's usually a pretty low RVP a low uh, true vapor pressure as well. And that's what we actually will use to uh, recover the vapors into that liquid state. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Any questions for South Dakota? Shaking heads. Okay. Okay. No other questions? Anybody else? Anyone know a fun joke? Halloween just passed, so I'll say one. So, how do you fix a jack -o a broken jack o' lantern? You use a pumpkin patch. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, guys. fire, but...